part 5 of polytechnic lecturer electronics previous year question discussions we are going to see some questions in this video the first question is you'll be seeing the questions on board okay so the question is when the transistor is in high saturation condition the biasing condition of base emitter that is b and collector base c b junction is dash okay so here the question is asking what is the biasing conditions for saturation region okay we know that for saturation region both the junctions that is base emitter and collector base both the junctions are forward biased okay we'll write it as fb forward bias forward bias this is the case for saturation what is the case for active active case for base emitter junction is only forward this is reverse biased right now when the both the junctions are reverse biased then it is called cut off then when the reverse is happening that is when the base emitter region is forward sorry reverse bias and when the collector base junction is forward bias we will call it as reverse active ok so these are the four general states right first one is active when the base emitter region is forward bias collector base junction is reverse bias so this is the active condition when the transistor will work as an amplifier then when the transistor will go to saturation both the junctions will be forward biased when both the junctions are reverse biased it is called cut off when the reverse is happening of the active we call it as reverse active region means base emitter will be reverse biased the collector base is forward biased here the question is only regarding the saturation and the option which is correct is option C that is base emitter is forward bias and collector base also forward bias. First question correct answer is option C. So this question is actually a very basic question from the transistors. Okay. So you should be knowing all the four configurations or all, all, all the four regions and what is the biasing condition for the regions also you should be knowing. Second question. Second question is theory question memory that loses its contents when the power is lost a non volatile b volatile c flash d static correct answer is very simple it is volatile memory so if the power is lost or when we power off the device if the memory is lost means it is a volatile memory if it is not getting erased or it is not uh, gone means it is called a non volatile memory right correct answer is option b very simple question now third question so the third question is the minority carrier current in a semiconductor diode is largely a function of dash that is the minority ca carrier current is mainly due to dash a amount of doping b temperature c forward bias voltage d reverse bias voltage correct answer is temperature the minority current is actually constituted by the temperature increase. When the temperature is increasing, what happens? The uh, electrons in the holes, they will break the bond or the electrons, free electrons will actually uh, get out of the, uh, the valence shell and they will start conducting. Okay, They will be free and they will be creating. So, the minority current will happen, minority carrier current will be generally generated due to the temperature increase. Okay, Correct answer is option B. Okay, so these are very basics of conductors. Now, fourth question. The fourth question is, in a multi-stage amplifier, the overall frequency response is determined by A, frequency response of each stage depending on the relationship with the critical frequencies. B, frequency response of first amplifier. No, it is not just depending on the frequency response of first amplifier. Then C, frequency response of last amplifier. No, it is not just depending on the last amplifier also. D, lower critical frequency of first amplifier and the upper critical frequency of the final amplifier. Okay, so, so in general, when the amplifiers are connected in cascade or when it is a multi-stage amplifier, so the total frequency response is actually depending on the frequency response of each stage and also depending on its relationship with the critical frequencies. Okay. So, the correct answer is A. So, just know that the total frequency is actually dependent on each stage's 
frequency response. Okay. Fourth question, correct answer is option A. Fifth question. Okay. Fifth question is, compared to bipolar transistor, a JFET has dash. A. Higher input impedance and lower voltage gain. B. Lower input impedance and high voltage gain. C. Higher input impedance and high voltage gain. D. Lower input impedance and low voltage gain. Okay. So the question is, compared to BJT, JFET has dash. So JFET is more noise resistant. So it is having higher input impedance, but the voltage gain is low. Okay. So for a JFET, it is having high input impedance, but voltage gain is low. So the low voltage gain. Okay. So that is the case for a JFET. The JFET is having high input impedance, but they are having low voltage gain as compared to a bipolar junction transistor or BJT. Correct answer is option A. Okay. Next question, which is the question number six. The sixth question is, okay, the ripple factor of a full wave rectifier circuit compared to that of half wave rectifier circuit without filter. A, half wave, sorry, half that of half wave rectifier. B, less than that of half wave rectifier circuit. C, equal to that, equal to that of half wave rectifier. D, none of the above correct answer. Okay. The correct answer is the ripple factor of half wave rectifier is actually greater or in reverse that is if you write the full wave and the half wave the ripple factor of full wave is generally 4.0.48 something I'm just writing the approximate value exact value you can find in the video called rectifiers uh, quick revision video there is a video which is called the rectifiers, all rectifiers quick revision and that I have included all the ripple factor everything. So this is the case of a full wave rectifier and for half wave it is 1.21 approximately. 1.21 I think it is 1.21 okay yeah. So this is the ripple factors. The for full wave rectifier is having a ripple factor of uh, 0.48 and for a half wave rectifier it is 1.21 okay. So this is without filter case okay. So if you examine the ripple factors, you can see that for a full wave rectifier, the ripple factor is less as compared to that of half wave. Okay. So, the question's correct answer is option B. For a full wave rectifier, ripple factor is less than that of half wave rectifier, which is option B is the correct answer. So, I am telling it once again. There is a quick revision video on rectifiers. I have included all the important concepts of rectifiers. Only important equations and these type of values I have included. Okay. And the basic circuit diagram also. Okay, So if you watch that videos or that video uh, on rectifier, you will cover the topic for a competitive examination. That's sure. Okay. So the sixth question, correct answer is option B. Now, seventh question. Okay. So the seventh question is. Okay. Seventh question is from capacitors. A capacitor is fully charged when? The voltage across the plates is half the voltage from the ground to one of the plates. No, that is not the correct answer. B, the current through the capacitor is the same as when the capacitor is discharged. Okay, so that will be the case. When the capacitor will be fully charged, the current will be the same as that of the capacitor when it is completely discharged. Okay, so when a capacitor will complete its charging that is complete charge will be get stored into a capacitor what will happen the current value will be equal to that of the value when the capacitor is discharged okay so that is the case when the capacitor is fully charged that is option e is option b is the correct answer okay so just know that when the capacitor is fully charged the current value will be equal to the value of current when the capacitor is completely discharged or discharged okay seventh question correct answer is option B. Eighth question. Okay. 
Eighth question is from basic transistor area. The saturation condition of transistor implies that. So what is a saturation condition actually indicating? That is a question. A. Collector current is highest possible value. Yes. The collector current will go to the peak value or the highest possible value when the current that is when the saturation is achieved. The collector current will be high. Right. That's right. Then. Option B, entire VCC get dropped across a load resistor. That's also right. The entire VCC will get dropped across a load resistor when the saturation point is achieved. That's also right. C, it acts as a closed switch with a negligible value of resistance. Again, right. Because we know that in saturation, the transistor will act as a closed switch. And when in uh, open circuit that is when the uh, cutoff region yeah that is the name cutoff region so these are the two regions right saturation and cutoff not just two but uh, one of the two there are other two also which is active and reverse active okay so when the cutoff region it acts as a open switch yeah okay so when the transistor is in saturation it will act as a closed switch. When the transistor is in cutoff, it acts as a open switch. And when the transistor is in active region, it acts as a amplifier. So these all things sh you should be knowing. Okay, basic things. So in saturation, it acts as a closed switch. In cutoff, it acts as an open switch. Now the question is only regarding to saturation. So you have to look for the options, which all options are right. So here, Option C is saying it acts as a closed switch with negligible value of resistance is a correct option. Option A is also right, B is also right, C is also right. So the correct answer is option D, all the above. Okay. So when the transistor is in saturation state, what all things will happen? Collector current will be uh, at its highest value. Then total VCC will get dropped across the load resistance and it will act as a closed switch. Okay. So option D, all the above is the correct answer. Ninth question. Ninth question is in a differential op amp configuration, a subtractor, a subtractor is called as a scaling amplifier, b all the mentioned, c summing amplifier, d difference amplifier. So we'll examine the options. Okay. So, a sub subtractor circuit configuration formed with a differential amplifier. So, is it called a summing amplifier? It is not. Is it called a difference amplifier? No, it is not. There is another uh, term called differential amplifier, but it is not called a difference amplifier. But it is called a scaling amplifier. Okay. So, in the uh, subtractor configuration of OPAM, we can call it as a scaling amplifier. Correct answer is option A. So consider that you are going to form a uh, subtractor with a differential amplifier or a op-amp. So there will be an inverting terminal, there is a non-inverting terminal. You are going to give two voltages. V1 here and V2 here. There will be a feedback resistance. Okay, there will be some other resistance connected for having voltage division. Okay, not necessarily. Okay, so... Like this, the uh, configuration of a subtractor will be this. Consider that this is R1, this is R2. The feedback we are calling is R3. Okay. Let this be the V out. So, what is the equation for V out? So, uh, you are having a feedback resistance. There is an R1, there is an R2. This resistance we will call as R4. Okay. So, we are going to call. Sorry, we are going to write the equation for V out. And the V out equation is V out equal to r3 by r1 that is feedback by input resistance into v2 minus v1 okay so this will be the equation for a subtractor circuit and we know that we are actually getting the difference of the voltages which is given to the terminals that is the general function of an op amp right it is taking the difference of voltages given to the input terminals and it is again divided by, uh, and that is, it is multiplied by a term called R3 by R1. So, it is going to scale the voltage. That is, it is going to scale the 
output voltage V2 minus V1 by a factor R3 by R1. Right. That is this voltage which is the difference voltage in between the two terminals is going to be multiplied by a term R3 by R1. So, it is called a scaling amplifier. Okay. So, this is a basic circuit for a op-amp based subtractor and this will be the output equation and due to this we are going to call the differential op-amp configuration of a subtractor as a scaling amplifier. Okay. Okay. So, it is a scaling amplifier. Now, next question which is the 10th question. Yeah, the 10th question is again from OPAM. You can expect a lot of questions from OPAM because there is theory questions, enough questions, enough topics are there from theory and also there is a lot of numerical questions can come. Okay, so 10th question is an ideal operational amplifier has A, infinite output impedance, B, zero input impedance, C, infinite bandwidth, D, all the above correct answer. No, all the options are not actually correct. Okay, we will discuss about various options. Option A, infinite output impedance. No, that is not a right answer because we know that for the case of a op-amp, so this is the op-amp configuration. I'm just drawing a circuit. Okay, so the output impedance is zero. Output impedance is equal to 0. Now why we are keeping the output impedance 0 because it will help us to couple the output with various other circuits that is if you are going to give the output of this op-amp to various other circuits so we have to keep the output impedance to be 0. So the option A is not right because it is saying that infinite output impedance it is not right output impedance is 0. Next let us see the option B. Option B is saying zero input impedance. No. Why? Because so we know that this is a differential amplifier or this is a op-amp. So here the input impedance is, I'll write it first. Okay. In, input impedance is kept as infinity. Why? Because we know that its aim is to amplify the difference of the two voltages coming to the two terminals. There are two input terminals and it will amplify the difference of the voltages coming to the two terminals. But there are also noises present. So we have to neglect these noises that are coming to the input side. So for this purpose, we are keeping the input impedance as infinity. So the option B is also not right. Then option C is saying infinite bandwidth. Yeah, that is the correct answer because so we are keeping infinite bandwidth to have a large range of operation. Okay. So, bandwidth should be infinity. That is right. D all the above not also right. Okay. Correct answer is option C. Infinite bandwidth. Okay. So, this is the correct answer. So, 10th question correct answer is option C. So, these are the 10 questions which I have included in this video. So, in every uh, parts of this previous year question discussion videos, I am trying to include maximum variety of questions. And I am trying to give maximum uh, explanations possible with each question. Okay. So, if you are finding the questions useful, please do give it a thumbs up and also share it with your friends who is preparing for the Polytechnic Lecturer Examination. And if you want more videos, please do subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and keep on watching.